Good morning, everyone. What a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord, to worship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're so glad you're here. We're glad you have tuned in on television and on YouTube. Welcome to worship. We have an attendance registration sheet in your bulletin. If you would pull that out and fill it out for us, the uh, offering will come a little bit earlier in the service this morning. So if you'd have that ready and put it in the offering plate, that would be helpful to us. A um, couple of announcements. We began our Lenten sermon series on Wednesday in the Ash Wednesday service. So if you were not able to be with us, uh, we started out on the road to glory. That's our sermon series for Lent. And uh, we pray that this will be a time when you take the time, take additional time to spend time in the presence of the Lord and reflect on all that he has done for us as we follow him on the road to the cross. A uh, couple of things. You know, the Lord loves for us to delight in him and to delight in one another, and we're providing you all with an opportunity to do that as we have a Mexican train taco bar night, just an, a time of good fellowship and enjoying the relationships that we have and perhaps even inviting others into that as well. So that will happen on March 18th, 5.30 to 8.30, and we'll take a free will offering to defray some of the costs of that meal. There's a sign-up sheet out in the gathering space outside the church office. If you would sign up, that'll help us know how much taco meat we need to be cooking. A um, couple of new Bible studies for Lent are beginning in the next couple of weeks, and I wanted to make you aware of those. Anyone is uh, welcome to come to the quest for holiness from deadly sin to divine virtue, and it will start a week from Monday night at 6 o'clock. And then two weeks from now, on Tuesdays, we'll start Perfect Love. Valerie is going to be our leader for that Perfect Love study for the women. And so if you would be interested in either one of those, just let me know. I'll be happy to give you more information and get you signed up for those. And then finally, don't forget, next week, our clocks spring forward. Sorry about that. One, one less hour of sleep next Saturday night. But don't forget to move your clocks ahead for next Sunday morning. And that's, that's all the announcements I have this morning. Let's prepare our hearts now to worship the Lord as our choir leads us.
Amen. Will you stand with us as you are able and we'll join together in the call to worship. You'll find it on the screen and it is responsive. Rejoice greatly, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, our king is coming. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You are our God, and we will praise you. You are our God, and we will exalt you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. As you remain standing, we'll sing our hymn of praise, All praise to thee, for thou, O King divine. Hallelujah. If you, you may be seated. That's Sig's favorite, one of, fav, one of his favorite hymns this morning. We have begun with a rousing hymn. And I'll tell you two reasons why, because it's, it comes directly out of one of my favorite scriptures, which is Philippians 2, 5 through 11. And um, on, on top of that, it fits with the message for this morning. So... <laughs> Woo, it all came together today. 
Let me lift up a couple of things as we come to our time of prayer. We know that all of you have concerns and, and things on your heart and your mind that you want to bring before the Lord. You know of people in your families and in the life of this congregation who are in need of our prayers. So bring those personal concerns as we come and, and pray this morning. Of course, we want to, I think every time we gather, anywhere we're gathered with brothers and sisters, we should be lifting up our brothers and sisters in the Ukraine and, and in Russia as well. Uh, also, we, we want to remind you, we told you uh, at the beginning of this process, I think, to be in prayer for our Staff Parish Relations Committee and the process of finding a new pastor to lead the congregation into the future. Well, we're continuing to make our way through that process, so we just want to remind you, please be in prayer for the person God has already chosen to lead this church. We don't know who that person is yet, but we pray that the Lord will, will bring the right one um, to the surface and that he or she will be appointed here by the bishop. So be in prayer for that. Let's come before the Lord together in prayer. If you'd like to join us here, you're welcome. Lord God, as the crowds greeted Jesus with loud hosannas, we desire that our lives declare his praise. Therefore, as we journey with him to the cross over these weeks, help us lay aside sin and self and pride. Wash us in the fountain of his blood. Help us build upon the foundation of faith you have established in our hearts. Convince us of our ongoing need for our Savior. Give us repentant hearts as well as full forgiveness. As you form in us the mind and heart of Christ, show us how to tread in his steps and make ourselves fully available to you for the sake of your glory in the world. Guide our desires and affections that we may show the world the likeness of Jesus in our day. Holy Spirit, help us to pray for the world that groans in anticipation of our Lord's return. Send your help moment by moment to every person living in Ukraine today. Grant wisdom to their leaders and courage to their hearts. Fill the nations around them with compassion, wisdom, and resolve to come alongside and send them the aid they need. We pray for brothers and sisters in China and North Korea and Russia who face increasing persecution. Give them bold witness and unshakable faith. Push back the darkness, defeat the enemy, and be glorified in every land, we pray. Merciful Father, have mercy on those who suffer anywhere in this world today, but especially we pray for those in our community who struggle with illness, addiction, grief, and sorrow of many kinds. We pray for family members and friends who need your healing mercy and your guiding hand. Show us how we may be a means of witness, support, 
and encouragement to them. Thank you for hearing us and for your mercy poured out upon us in Jesus. In all things, we give you praise and rejoice in God our Savior, through Christ our Lord. Amen. As I mentioned earlier, our, in, our uh, offering comes a little bit earlier in the service this morning, so um, hear the invi- well, read the invitation with me, because this is, this is about the corporate body uh, speaking before the Lord. So read that with me from Psalm 34, verse 3. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Oh, isn't that the purpose of our lives, to glorify God? And as the Westminster Catechism says, to enjoy him forever. Every aspect of our worship is all for God's glory, magnifying his name so that others will come to know him. So as we present our offerings to the Lord in these moments, we do so for the purpose of bringing him glory on this earth to worship him with all that we are and with all that we have in an extravagant expression of love for our Redeemer that exalts his name in all the earth as we've been singing. So let's give to the Lord.
Heavenly Father, as we raise our offerings to you, we also humble our hearts before you. We know that in the presence of your glory, our offerings are meager. You pour out abundance upon us every day, and we are grateful. We want the world to know you and worship you with us. May these gifts magnify your name far beyond the walls of this building and send ripples of witness out beyond our families and our community until all the world knows your glorious name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to just remain standing as we hear the word of the Lord this morning. It comes from John's Gospel, chapter 12, beginning at verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. You may be seated. Lord, this is, this is your time to do your work in our lives. As we come face to face with your word, as we encounter the truth of your word, the eternal truth of your word, we know that you are always in the process of shaping us and molding us and making us more like Christ. And so as that happens today, we will give you thanks. Father, I offer my words to you, I offer my voice to you, and we all offer the posture of our hearts to you that we might be receptive willing to hear you as you speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. So as Beth said a few minutes ago, we already started this, uh, this series, this sermon series, The Road to Glory, on Ash Wednesday. And so this is the second sermon in that series. It's actually a continuation of the text that we had on, um, on Ash Wednesday. And what we're doing over the course of this series is we're covering the road to the cross. We're covering from, from Bethany, where things started, all the way to the empty tomb. And we're calling this series The Road to Glory because it's through these, the most important activities and things that Jesus came to do, the most important days of his ministry, days of turmoil and temptations and trials and troubles, that we will discover that Jesus Christ is glorified, risen, and lifted high. But to be glorified required that Jesus be obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And that encompasses this season in the Christian calendar we call Lent. Two things I need to point out as we start. First of all, um, one, one is that we're, just, we're going chronologically through these events. And so I just want you to know, we know that this is not Palm Sunday on the church calendar. We've not lost our minds. We know that that's the case. But what happens so often during the Lenten season is we, we go through Lent and then we come to Palm Sunday and we celebrate Palm Sunday and then we have a service on Monday, Thursday or, or Good Friday or sometimes both and then we have Easter. But there's a whole lot of other things in that week that we never touch or we never get to. And so we decided we were going to drill down and go a little deeper this time and, and look at the events of that week. And we're going to spend a, a Sunday for each of those. So, 
So Palm Sunday falls today. Um, and we just want you to know that, that's the, that we understand that and that's intentional. The second point is that although the road is to glory, the events that we are going to talk about today take us on an unexpected route. Every message in this series has a key word attached to it. You'll see it in the title of each of them um, at the end of it. And so you'll see in the title today, the, the key word is revelation. They're all shun words, T-I-O-N words, but revelation. Because as Jesus entered Jerusalem, he publicly and clearly revealed the kind of savior that he is. The road to glory is bathed in humility. The events of John 12, 12 through 19, reveal that Jesus came in humility and meekness. And, and it, quite frankly, it caught the crowd that was there gathered uh, off guard, and it caught his disciples completely off guard. They did not expect that. So that's where we're starting today, on this interplay between humility and glory. We'll start with this point, just to, just to set this all in context. As Jesus entered Jerusalem, the world's idea of glory was revealed. The world's idea of glory was revealed. In the eyes of the world, the louder the roar of the crowd, the more important the person is at the center of it, you know? You, you understand that. Uh, those of you who, um, well, who hasn't heard of Tiger Woods, okay? Everybody's heard of Tiger Woods. When he was at the pinnacle of his golfing success, the tiger roar was well known and could be heard anywhere on a golf course when he made a particularly spectacular putt. If we're honest, all of us want a bit of glory. We want to be known for something. And, and maybe that fire is burning a little bit more brightly when we're younger. But even in our 60s or 70s or even 80s, we want to feel significant. We have, we have a glory hunger because we all want to know that we matter, that we have significance. Most of us try to wade around in puddles of glory, like getting praise or accolades from other people or getting the next promotion or getting recognition for something we did or, or winning a prize of, of some kind. If we're honest, most of us would like to be at the top of somebody's list in something, in anything. We'd like to see our name up in lights in some way, shape, or form. Even little snippets of fame and attention from others will suffice. The word glory is an important word in the Bible, and sometimes it gets thrown around, but we don't really think about what it means. In the Bible, it's translated many ways, but literally in the Bible, glory means heaviness or weightiness. Heaviness or weightiness. And it has to do with importance, has to do with reputation, has to do with significance. Heaviness or weightiness. Like the phrase, worth its weight in gold, it means something of great value. It means something of importance, something that is irreplaceable. When we give the Lord glory, when we say we're going to give the Lord glory, it means we elevate him in position or importance. We recognize him for the significance or worth above all other things. Jesus could have sought glory for himself through the accolades of the throngs. Well, what, what was all the excitement about? Why, why was there such excitement? Really, there were several reasons that, that all sort of came together. First of all, Jerusalem was packed with pilgrims who had come for the feast of the Passover. It was one of the required feasts for, for the good Jews to come and attend in Jerusalem. And that meant that there were hundreds of thousands of people in the city. And on top of that, Many of them had traveled from Galilee. Well, Jesus did so many, of his, so many of his miracles and his teachings in Galilee that they would have had plenty of opportunity to hear Jesus preach and teach. Probably some of them had witnessed his miracles firsthand. And even if they hadn't, they would have had neighbors or they would have had family members, they would have had friends or somebody who had. And to compound the excitement, Jesus had recently raised Lazarus from the dead in nearby Bethany. It was just, short, just a short distance outside of, of Jerusalem. And as John reminds us in verse 17, 
the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him to the dead continued to spread the word. In other words, the word was getting around about this guy and people wanted to know. They were curious. The crowd was shouting portions of Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. You can look that up and read those words for yourself. Uh, uh, Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. That psalm was filled with hope for deliverance that was to come from enemies. Hosanna! That's, that's an imperative that means save. Hosanna, Lord! Save us, Lord! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Palm branches had long been used just to be waved or even just as... Uh, as uh, on coins or uh, other means in, as a symbol of a victorious ruler. Those were being pulled off trees and, and waved in the air and laid down in front of him. So here it was, a perfect storm of adulation fueled by high nationalistic expectations. Because as we know, Israel was under the boot of Rome and had been for a long time. They were nothing more than a puppet state. But despite the crippling power of the Romans, the Jews had not given up hope. The ancient prophet, prophecies said a Savior would come, that, a, that a, there was going to be a day when a Savior would ride into, into Jerusalem to l- deliver God's people from the evil of the ungodly. Hence the shouts, blessed is the king of Israel. Most of the people there would have known that 550 years prior to this, God, through the prophet Zechariah, had spoken, had promised this Messiah would come. If you read Zechariah 9, 8 through 10, included and incorporated in those three verses are the words that were being, that, were being, uh, that John included and incorporated in this particular text. This is what it said, the Lord said, These are the words of the Lord. But I will defend my house against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people, for now I am keeping watch. Okay, here, these will sound familiar. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to seas and from the river to the ends of the earth. John took advantage of that, of those words and made sure to tie them in and connect them in with uh, the story as it unfolded. If I'd, been, if I'd been greeted in that way by this uh, a two-mile-long throng of people shouting and carrying on and, and cheering and worshiping, I know what I would have done. I would have, been, I would have been waving. I would have been bowing. You know, I would have been given the, the thumbs up all the way along the parade route, all the way from Bethphage to Jerusalem. In all likelihood, that was the expectation of the disciples of Jesus. Finally, they were thinking, finally, Jesus is going to reveal to the whole world his power. He's going to show what he's capable of. He's going to take his rightful place as king. That explains their jockeying for positions, for leadership positions, their their lust for the top cabinet posts in his administration. Because we remember even on the way to Jerusalem, they were doing that jockeying, trying to decide who was going to get the most important seats when when Jesus took power. And all of that begins to make sense now. But you see, they were all filled with worldly ideas of glory, as much as the crowd was. But how wrong they were. The crowd was wrong. The disciples were wrong. They miscalculated. They misunderstood the will of God that Jesus came to fulfill, the intent of Jesus to do his Father's will. The fact is, if anyone did deserve glory, it was Jesus. In fact, he could have fulfilled the expectations of the crowd. He could have, he could have called down legions of angels to, to throw the Romans out of Jerusalem. But in so doing, he would have lost the will of his father. He would not have carried out his father's purpose. Instead, he entered 
the city publicly to face his enemies, but not as a nationalistic conqueror to do battle with the Romans and to subdue the Gentiles. He came to fight the spiritual battle and to be the conqueror of sin and death. His glory would come in a different way. And here's how it comes. As, as Jesus entered Jerusalem, he revealed glory found in humility. He revealed glory found in humility. Rather than seeking the world, worldly accolades that are just here today and are gone tomorrow, Jesus showed how to find real and lasting glory. But it's not where we expect. It's not in the applause of the crowds or the attaboys or the girls or the pat pats on the back that we crave so much. It's not in the bigger office. It's not in the larger paycheck. It's not in more recognition for being a good person. It's not for receiving recognition for doing lots of good things. The key word for today is revelation. And Jesus revealed the true way to glory, the true way that has lasting significance, the true way that truly matters and gives value to life. And it's quite opposite what the world offers. True glory is found in humbling ourselves, asking the Lord to move us from self-centered human beings to serve him by serving others. Jesus chose a, a lowly beast of burden, the colt of a donkey, rather than the galloping, powerful steed. And he did so to make clear his intentions. Now let's not be confused here. This is not... Jesus' first hint of humility. It's a continuation of his total ministry. As we evaluate the total ministry of Jesus, we find that he did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You can read that in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. That was part of that conversation with the disciples as they were jockeying for positions in Mark 10, 45. But his disciples missed it. His glorification came through humility, through lowering himself, as we sang in that opening hymn today, and through giving and serving and suffering, especially for the least, the last, and the lost. He did not focus on himself, but on others, and in his example called us to follow. The most important part was still to come, which we'll be focusing on in the coming weeks. His life of humility and the way he chose to enter Jerusalem set the stage. This was setting the stage for the next seven days when Jesus would serve all humanity by suffering in unimaginable ways, in ways that we can't even really fathom, willingly giving himself to suffer and to die so that all who turn to him can be saved from their sin and given true and lasting life. I, don't, I love those little glimpses into the scripture where you, where you get a sense of the integrity of the authors. And John does it here. The Apostle John does it here in verse 16. Uh, because he, he makes it clear. He, said, um, he says, at first the disciples did not understand all of this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things that had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. In other words, he's fessing up. Because he was one of those. He was one of those. He said, we just missed it. We were right there in the middle of it. And we just, we missed the whole point. We didn't see it until later. Till after the crucifixion. Till after the resurrection. It was only after all of that. After the humiliation that Jesus suffered. After his beatings and his torture. And his burial and his resurrection. That the light came on. And the disciples said, oh, we see it now. We're to be seeking True glory through humility. The glory is found in sacrificial giving and serving and loving and helping and sometimes, perhaps even oftentimes, suffering. That's the message Jesus' disciples, including us, carry to the world. As we carry Jesus and his message to the world, we reveal his glory found in humility. You see, it's our job. That's our job. Our job is to reveal that kind of savior to the world. We're to tell others about that. Well, how do we do that? I'll let you get those couple of spots filled in there, and then I'm going to mention two ways that we, that we do that. How do we reveal his glory found in humility? First of all, we draw attention to Jesus and not ourselves. We draw attention to Jesus and not to ourselves. 
We give him the glory that is due him. I don't want to call all of us donkeys, but I do know, I do want to point out that just as the donkey carried Jesus into Jerusalem, so we carry him into the world. And can I just tell you, in the triumphal entry, nobody was focused on, the, on that donkey. Nobody was going, oh, what a beautiful beast. Look at that. Oh, my word. I've never seen such a beautiful donkey. They were focused on the one who was sitting on the donkey. And it's the same way with us. No one is to be admiring us or looking at us. They were, we, are, we are to make sure that the focus is on the one that we carry, the message of the one that we carry into the world. Paul, car- Paul prayed that for the, for the church in Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians 1.12. In 2 Thessalonians 1.12, he said, We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ, that that Christ would be glorified, that his worth, his value, his weight would be shown to the world through us. The focus is not on us, but the one that we seek to glorify. Friends, no matter what your station is in life, no matter where you've come from, no matter where you've been, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have the privilege, the unique privilege of in your own realm, and sphere of influence, you have the privilege of glorifying Jesus by lifting him up, by revealing him, by showing him to others, by not by focusing on yourself and your own needs, but by showing others the love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second thing we do is we grow in Christ-likeness by humbling ourselves. We grow in Christ-likeness. We grow to become like Christ by humbling ourselves. Maxie Dunham, in the March Prayer Guide for the Wesleyan Covenant Association, had a a quote that caught my eye. In speaking of of overcoming our self-centeredness, he spoke about the need for humility. But like all things in in our life, friends, just hear this, like all things in our Christian life, we are Christians under construction. None of us is the finished product. We're all still growing. And, and, and Maxi brings that to mind because he, and here's his quote, he says, Believers are like immigrants to a new country, not yet completely habituated to its ways of life. They have accepted citizenship in a new world and must learn to live in it. And then he added this comment, Being humble and meek is the dynamic of learning to live as citizens of a new land. We grow into that idea of being humble and living in with different values than the rest of this world. That's the lesson on humility taught by our Lord Jesus and so clearly demonstrated by the way he lived and suffered and died. It's something we grow into. Behind the, the home that I grew up near, near Peoria, in Peoria County, um, we, we were one of the first houses in the neighborhood and we ended up sort of at the, uh, a lot of water came down through that neighbor and went through a sluice that sort of ran right along the back edge of of our property. And my dad spent a lot of time and energy uh, and money over the years trying to keep that back area from washing out. What was a problem for my dad was a wonderful gift to me as a young boy because all that water All that water became the start of a creek down in the gully behind our house. And when the rushing waters would subside and it was safe to go down there, got down to a manageable flow, you can believe I spent lots of time down in that creek, especially when I discovered that there were frogs that were down there. They had inhabited that space. Well, that that creek coursed on down through the gully, and as I got a little bit older, I followed it, and 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 I... I went down a little bit further, and lo and behold, I discovered that that creek opened up into a pond, and that there were turtles in that pond. And so I spent lots of time down at that pond. And as I grew and had some companions who liked to explore, we continued to follow that creek, and we went all the way down to where it joined and formed a small stream. And And in that stream, we discovered there were fish 
I mean, it was just getting better and better as we, as we went along. And we spent many hours down there playing in that stream in the woods around it. And as I got older, curiosity continued to grow and we could cover a little bit more distance. And eventually we followed that stream down to where it joined Kickapoo Creek. And we knew that Kickapoo Creek ran and joined the Illinois River not too far from there. And we knew that the Illinois River went down to Grafton and Grafton joined the Mississippi River and the Mississippi River went all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico and entered into the ocean. And wouldn't you know, all of that started in that little sluice right behind our house. It's that way when we seek to live with humility that glorifies Jesus. We start small. We start right where we are today, this day. We start right where we are, but we don't stay there. We continue to explore. We continue to walk along the edge of that and, and to grow into that. We grow in Christ's likeness. And as we grow, we discover even as we go, there's so much more to explore. There's so much more ground to cover. There's so many other places that we can move out and, and discover what it means to serve and to give and to offer our lives for the sake of Jesus. That's the way it is with the Christian life. That's the way it is with growing in Christ's likeness through humbly serving others. Step by step by step, we turn away from the definition of glory by the world and we turn towards the definition of glory by Christ. We follow the one who has said yes, who could have said yes to all that glory, but instead at the, in the Last Supper later in this week, which we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, he would stoop down and wash the dirty feet of those who are not even fit to untie his sandals. Friends, there are times when the greatest power to change the world proceeds not from an act of forceful self-centeredness, but from an act of gracious self-denial. Because self-denial is an expression of love for others. Sometimes it is only by voluntarily surrendering the very rights and desires and comforts that this world tells us to hold fast to at all costs that a longer term victory is won. That's the example set by our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear this, hear this now. Gentleness and humility are not signs of weakness, although the world would say that. Gentleness and humility are not signs of weakness, but of a strength of a different sort, a sort that the world doesn't know. The world hasn't discovered that yet. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once contrasted the approach to power commonly taught by the world and that modeled by Jesus. He said, 10,000 fools proclaim themselves into obscurity. In other words, look at me, look at me, look at me, focus on me. And people say, forget that. 10,000 fools proclaim themselves into obscurity while one wise man, and that's man with a capital M, Jesus, forgets himself into immortality. Let's be wise people. Let's be wise and discover a life of humility. Let's live into that. And we have time to prepare to live more fully into that in this coming week as we celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion today. And we remember that it's in, in this sacrament that we remember the most precious gift of all of our Lord as our Savior went to the cross to die for us, giving the ultimate life-giving sacrifice for us and for all who will turn to him. Let's live into that. Let's be wise. Let's grow in that regard. Let's take a step along that creek today towards whatever is next as the Lord leads us. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for the clear example that our Lord set for us Help us live into that. Help us to be fulfilled in that. Help us to discover the joy of living a life of humility, a life humbly serving and giving and helping others. Thank you for this sacrament that we're going to experience today that reminds us of the ultimate example of humility of our Lord. Thank you for being with us. We thank you for helping us, for we know we cannot do any of that on our own. We, we are caught up with that 
glory bug of the world, and we need to be separated from that. So cleanse us, Lord. Set us on a new path. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So here's, here's an invitation, an invitation to Holy Communion. And I just want you to know all, all here are welcome. Everyone is welcome to come to the table. We are, this is an open table and all, all can come and can receive. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in love and peace with their neighbors. So come with joy. Come knowing the... Welcome of the Lord as we receive the sacrament. In order to prepare for that, we're going to pray together a prayer of confession. And you'll find that up on the, up on the screen. And I'll invite you to, to pray that with me as we, as we uh, seek the Lord's mercy. Join with me. God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to seek and save the lost. We confess that we have strayed from you and turned aside from your way. We are misled by pride, for we see ourselves pure when we are stained. We see ourselves great when we are small. We have failed in love, neglected justice, and ignored your truth. Have mercy, O oh God, and forgive our sin. Return us to paths of righteousness and to your green pastures through Jesus Christ our, and our Lord. Amen. Now in the quiet of this moment, just personalize that confession and offer yourself to the Lord, asking for his cleansing in your life. Second Corinthians 5.21 has what's oftentimes referred to as the great exchange. It says that although he had no sin, Jesus became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Thanks be to God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Thank you so much. So uh, let's take a minute, and um, as we get the table set and ready, uh, we'll invite you to just greet those around one another with the words, the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Let's exchange the peace. All right, if you'll have a seat, we'll join together in the great Thanksgiving. And a um, portion of this will be responsive as we consecrate these elements and invite the Lord's presence here with us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You brought all things into being and called them good. From the dust of the earth, you formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When rain fell upon the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, you bore up the ark on the waters, saved Noah and his family, and made a covenant with every living creature on earth. 
When you led your people to Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights, you gave us your commandments and made us your covenant people. When your people forsook your covenant, your prophet Elijah fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and on your holy mountain he heard your still, small voice. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your Spirit led him into the wilderness, where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life, presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days, and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave thanks, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray our Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So John and Sue Allen will be on one side and we'll be on the other side and we invite you to come forward as you are able. If you're not able to come forward, we will come and serve you right where you are. And so um, we want all to be able to participate and everybody will get that opportunity. These are gifts, the gifts that come from God's hand, reminders of his humble service all the way to the point of death, death on a cross. Come and receive with thanksgiving. Amen.
You'll find a prayer of thanks for us to share together that's on the screen. Will you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for the mystery of this sacrament that nourishes us for your service, for the ministry of this sacrament that makes us whole in relationship with you once again as we find our sins forgiven and our lives refreshed in your mercy. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who makes it possible for this sacrament to be life-giving for us and for others to whom we will offer this message of salvation in Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. And now if you'll stand with us, we'll sing together our closing hymn, Hosanna, loud Hosanna. Thank you so much. prayer as we were here was that in some way shape or form those of you who are been here in this worship service today will walk out of here as new creatures new creation as God has been at work in your life and that you will be the ones who are able to be the bearers of the good news of Jesus one who gave himself freely and willingly and that you, in your own life, will be willing to give of yourself freely and willingly for the cause of Christ and for the kingdom of God. May it be so, and as you go, may the peace and the joy and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit go with you. Amen. Amen.